Live from the CES show floor, we are here with JK, our U.S. semiconductor leader to discuss all things semiconductor and maybe a bit of AI here at CES. JK, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, we've been here a couple days now, chance to roam the show floor. Interestingly, this year there are no chips anywhere at, no, okay, that's not true. What, had, what have you seen so far in the first day and a half that strikes your fancy? I think what, what I was most surprised about being here for the first couple of days is the breadth of what is here on the show floor. So we talk a lot about convergence and how all the industries now connect. This is no longer just consumer electronics. There is a lot of stuff here. So I was really surprised about the breadth and the different types of companies you find from obviously the big names, but also a lot of the you know, smaller, new emerging companies, which are always very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about generative AI and what you're seeing here at CES and in general in the semiconductor landscape. Uh, let me give a little context here. I've mentioned this on a previous call. The estimates out there are that the AI chip market could be up to $400 billion by 2028. The entire industry is only about, supposed to be about $800 billion that year. We're kind of dealing with the potential of AI chips being literally half the semiconductor industry. That's sort of a little context setting there. Yeah, I think what, what you see here is AI is everywhere, right? Every device which you talk about on CES has some level of AI in it. And I think there is a lot um, which will happen in 2025, we'll, we'll start figuring out what exactly the AI really does for us. So AI in you know, refrigerators and washing machines, how does that really help our life? But more importantly, if you think about all the interactions we do with all of the devices we have, whether it be our car, whether it be um, the household devices, I think it's going to be very interesting. Now, the, the other thing which I think is, is increasingly interesting is that um, you start seeing here, if you put all the pieces together, that that's only the start. You see that you know, there's a lot of focus on generative AI, a lot of focus on um, human interaction, how do we talk to our devices. Um, but you also start seeing much more robotics, much more focus on you know, a different type of AI in, in our future. Now, we had this conversation yesterday, actually. Let's kind of tease this topic out. So, you said it perfectly in a conversation where the AI we have now has been kind of training on the simplest and, and data out there, there's something new coming, this physical AI idea. Yeah, I think if, if you look into, we think, we think sometimes that you know, what we're seeing right now is sort of the edge of where things are going. We think of generative AI, we think of large language models, we think about how that can help us, how that can create agents, how these agents can start doing our job. And we see that in reality already today. There's a lot of agents which we have in customer service, but also, for example, in self-driving cars, which you could consider as agents. I think where it gets really interesting is if you think about that, we, we are largely focused initially on this one dimensional, you know, the, the AI agent can talk to us in our language, they understand what we say and they can go and give us a meaningful answer. If you start expanding that concept and you see, for example, a lot of the initial robots running around here, th there are many more dimensions you could imagine. So if you think of, you know, um, where is the future of that chip demand going to come from? How are we going to get to that 400 billion? I think it is by moving not just into generative AI in the way we use large language models right now, but much more on, you know, how do we get machines to operate in the real world and actually start doing tasks which are not as you know, traditional robotic rehearsed as they were before. From a, if I'm a chip, if I'm a bunch of chips in a data center, dealing with all of the language in the world, all of the text in the world that's ever been done is a really, really big hard problem. Right. On the other hand, 38 minutes of, of, of whatever's being uploaded to video sharing sites is probably a million times more bits than that. That's right. These chips are going to have to deal with much more data in much harder problems in the future. This is what has been called physical AI is the term being used. So here's my conversation that you and I had yesterday. If I'm looking at all of the chip demand we have in 2025, we've kind of got a nice clear picture of I understand why people are buying chips. We're putting them on computers and in smartphones. But if we start thinking, how can we possibly get to 400 billion, we need to start thinking about things like physical AI. 
and I think all the building blocks which we can see on the on the show floor are here, right? I, I think all of the things you see right now, there is an increased focus on, of course, the big data centers and the big, you know, how do we train these these complex models? Complex because they do all the different languages, complex because they do all the video um, interpretation. But if you start thinking about, you know, taking that into the real world, into a physical world where an AI agent, a, a robot needs to look around and be able to evaluate everything which is going on, that complexity increases, you know, infinitely. Um, I think the, the other thing which I think is a lot on the show floor here is sort of the difference between edge AI um, devices and the data center devices. And I think if we think day to day about AI, we typically focus on the data center side of it. We focus on the big training of the big complicated models and how we then have devices use these models. I think if you start thinking about how, for example, um, autonomous vehicles drive, but also how robots operate in a sort of unbound world where they can freely um, uh, roam around, you, you will see that you need that high processing power on the edge combined with you know, the, the infinite learning loops which we, which we see in our data centers. I, I like your real world phrase. One of my favorite factory tours involved a robot working and there was a big yellow line on the floor mm -hmm. and I asked the guy who was doing the tour, why is the big yellow line there? And he said, if you go across it, the robot might accidentally pull your head off. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's having robots working with human beings in an, un it's a surprisingly hard computational problem. Mm -hmm. Which leads to, we're talking agentic, mm -hmm. we're talking robots, they're doing a lot of clever things. Are we approaching AGI? Strong artificial intelligence. There's a lot of definitions out there, I don't want to push too hard on this, mm -hmm. but there's some implications to that. I think we, we have a lot of building blocks associated to that right now. And I think uh, you know, putting all these building blocks together will still take a little bit of time. But it becomes easier and easier to imagine that we're on a path where um, agents will become more than just co-pilots. Because I think today's focus is very much around the co-pilot logic, right? We're, we're using agents um, as a help to us. And actually, we're doing that largely to train these agents because we're basically telling them when they're wrong. And that allows agents to get better and better up to some moment in time where they can start autonomously um, performing certain tasks. I think as we as we expand that journey, I think AGI will become increasingly real. And I think it, it has a couple of implications we really need to think about. I think geopolitically and socioeconomically, both of these things I think have a you know, very big impact, which I think is something which over the coming couple of years is gonna get increasing attention. So this is where I wanna drill down. Currently, there are a lot of companies here in, at, at, at CES. And there's a, I actually, you don't know this, but I travel around with a very small kit of screw, screwdrivers and I unscrew all the boxes and I look at the chips inside. Mm -hmm. That's not true. But if I did, there would be a whole bunch of chips made on advanced node technologies that currently the US and its allies are trying to restrict the export of to other states. Meanwhile, those other states are also restricting certain materials in, in and this we've written about this in predictions and yep. supply chains in past years. But in every single box in here, although there's a bunch of really advanced chips, there's also a bunch of less advanced chips and the boxes don't work without both sets of chips. Yeah. Meanwhile, we've got chips acts, we've got restrictions, we've got tariffs. How do you see that geopolitical world unfolding in 2025? I don't think we can go much beyond that, but it's an important topic for this year in supply chains. That's right, and I think if you look over the last couple of years, a lot has changed in supply chains in the semiconductor industry, but specifically on the geopolitical notice, I think a lot of the reshoring of manufacturing, for example, into the US, is, is focused on very advanced technology. It's focused on advanced nodes, it's focused on advanced packaging. Those are largely the investments which are being supported through the CHIPS Act. And your point is absolutely valid, which is in order to make um, any of the big uh, server racks we see here, in order to make any of the devices we see here, um, you don't just need the leading node part, you also need all the older technology. What you see happening is that in the rest of the world there's a lot of investment in the more traditional um, nodes and even though we can erect trade barriers, um, we, we will continue to see sort of an increase in supply of older technology which will continue to make it um, you know, important for US-based companies to not just think of, uh, you know, their, their high-value chips, but also to think of the whole ecosystem and how, how it all comes together. I was doing some analysis before this call. Mm -hmm. Of the 10 largest companies in the world by market cap, one of them is an oil and gas company. Mm -hmm. 
kind of kind of old school, but it, there's one. There's one. There's no banks. There's no healthcare. The other nine are all tech companies. Of those nine, three of them are pure play semiconductor companies, and the other six tech companies, all of them have chip projects building and designing their own AI chips. It is a remarkable story. My my final question to you is: This is your first CES, right? That's right. So. You've got an infinitely large suitcase. What's the toy, what's the thing you want to bring back home from CES after your first year here? I think the, the, the most practical thing I've seen here um, is uh, something which I think we've been thinking about for a while but seems to now work, which is an immediate translation device where you can speak to and it would immediately translate uh, you know, what people are saying into the right language. If you combine that with, um, uh, for example, what uh, has been shared in one of the keynotes um, uh, prior to CES of one of the big AI companies, you'll find that th there's a lot of things which we will start thinking about differently and that gets me very excited. And an example is rather than thinking about you know, language and just the way we traditionally um, think about translation, um, I, I think you, you will now see much more um, focus on not so much recording an analog signal, trying to process it and then sort of read it out again, but much more interpret what someone is trying to say, get into that translation and have basically it sound in your ear as if the person you're talking to with the same emotion, with the same responsiveness, is actually speaking the language you understand. I think that was a very small thing which seems super practical and would help us a lot because also for us we have a lot of our colleagues here from all of our different member firms who um, you know, would be so much easier if you could all talk in the same language. That's a pretty cool wish list to bring back home. It kind of makes my new TV set look <laughs> sort of shabby. JK, thank you so much for joining us here at CES. We will have you back next year talking about all things semiconductor and CES 2026. I look forward to that.